Hello there, everybody. This is Mr. Dunaway, and I am ready to start Chapter 4, Section 4 with you here as we start looking at graphing a function rule. You should have this note template in front of you. If you don't, hopefully you can find it at my website and uh, follow along. If you are totally desperate, you can do it without the template. It'll take a little more work, but it's not impossible. So here we go. Let's get rolling in as we start graphing a function rule. Hopefully you can keep up with this. Please hit pause as you go through the video as necessary to make sure you get everything down. Bring me your questions to class, please. Here we go. Let's, this is actually review for us as we started talking about functions. In chapter four, we talked about inputs and outputs, and we uh, gave you the picture of a function machine that might contain an equation such as this. And this is an input. That's the independent variable. It goes into the function machine. It's affected by this equation, 2x plus 1. If we took that input as x, independent variable is x, 2 times 3, that would mean 2 times 3 plus 1. And what does it put out? In this case, it would uh, output would be 7, and that is the dependent variable, or y, because this value of 7 depends upon what goes into the machine. There, so if we did the same thing for 2 and 3, Negative 2 here, if you take negative 2 times 1 half and add it to 4, you can double check my work, but I believe that works out to be positive 3. And number 3 is an interesting one here, because here they told you what the dependent variable was. They told you what the output is, or y. So you can think of it like this, that negative 11, that y, the output, is equal to negative 3x plus 1. So if you think about that for a moment, you might realize you're going to have to solve an equation here. Do a little bit of basic math here. Uh, that's negative 12 is equal to negative 3x, and you divide that by negative 3. You can actually figure out what that input would have been. It was <clears throat> negative 12 divided by negative 3 is positive 4. And that is positive 4 right there. Hopefully that makes sense to you. And let's take a look at 4 and 5 then. And 4 and 5 uh, looks like it says the inputs of a function are the domain of the function. That's true. That's true. The domain, that's about this word domain, which you need to know what that means. The domain is essentially x. Okay, if this picture up here makes sense to you, that input is the domain. Okay, the domain is x. That's a math word that you need to know. The input is also called the domain. The possible values going into the function is the domain. A function pairs every input with exactly one output. That's true as well. In other words, if I use this one, if I input 4, I have to get that every time. Okay, it's you, you can't input 4 one time and then input 4 and get something else a second time. That's what they're trying to tell you here. Okay, every input has to have exactly one output. There. Moving on down the page, this word discrete, that's uh, an important part of this lesson here. You need to know that discrete means uh, something, this is a type of data, okay? This is the type of data of the uh, independent variable. or x, okay? The independent variable, one type of data is discrete, okay? And you'll need to know that if I am talking about discrete data, and you'll have to be able to recognize it, we're talking about a type of data that has unconnected parts, unconnected elements to it. In other words, it's a type of data that might not include frac uh, fractional or decimal values, okay? And you have to be able to identify that. Uh, here's an example. They try to say that the set of integers is discrete. Okay, integers are negative numbers like that go to infinity to the left, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 dot. But you notice there are a lot of values that exist that are not in here. For example, all of the numbers between 1 and 2, such as 1.5, 1.51, 1.52, are not integers. So this data is discrete because there are values that don't, that they skip to be included in that set. However, the set of real numbers, that is not discrete because real numbers basically includes all the numbers that you could name, uh, including decimals or fractions. Uh, the, the exception would be things called irrational numbers, but they're not including that in this particular group. 
here. So that's one example and a non-example of discrete. Well, let's see if we can identify discrete in uh, a situation here in just a moment. It says circ circle the word that means the opposite of discrete. Well, if this means it has breaks in it, the other type is called continuous. That would be a type of data where that would include everything, every possible fractional value in between the values of x as you go. Let's look at 7 and see if we can make this click for you if you're a little bit confused. As we see examples, I think this would make more sense to you. For example, uh, this says circle the situation that describes the discrete set. Well, the possible temperatures in Florida. Okay, consider this. Consider if you were graphing the temperatures Okay, and these were temperatures, all right, and is it possible that if you're graphing temperatures that you could have, let's say that's uh, 10 and that's 20, could you have a value in between 10 and 20, like 10.5? Is that a possible temperature? How about 10.51? How about 10.52? They're all possible. Okay, so, so this type of data is called continuous because the temperature can be graphed in any possible number that we can name. Um, now, uh, unlike this one over here, let's say that you're graphing the number of oranges, okay? The number of oranges, if, if for some reason that were the number of oranges, though that would be a strange type of indi uh, independent variable. If you're selling oranges at a fruit stand, okay, now you have to be real here, you're probably, if that's one, you're probably not going to sell half of an orange. Now, we can be silly and make up a scenario where you might, but in reality, when you go to the store, you don't buy fractional values of fruits unless you buy it already uh, sliced up. That's not what they're talking about here. Okay, so the number, if you're just selling whole oranges, then there are certain possible values that you could not sell. You wouldn't sell 1.5 oranges. Okay, so this data is called discrete because it contains breaks within uh, its possible values. Okay, so continuous and discrete are the two types of data that we uh, are talking about here. Well, we'll come back to that in a moment as we need to now talk about how to graph a function rule. And we'll start with a generic one here and then we'll see an application after this. It says, what is the graph of the function y equals one half x minus one, and we are going to uh, make a table and uh, graph this function here. So they went ahead and gave you a table. What you're going to have to do? So let's fill in this table and let's figure out what this graph will look like. Well, they tell us that uh, the x value in this particular problem, this one, is negative one. So here's the function y is equal to 1 half x minus 1. So we're going to plug negative 1 in there and we are going to work that problem out. So you're going to have negative 1 half minus 1 and that works out to be negative 1.5. You can double check my math and that gives us a uh, ordered pair of negative 1 comma negative 1.5. And if we do the same thing for this 0, we love 0 because 0 tends, makes things go away. 1 half times 0 is 0, so that's negative 1. So you have the order pair 0, negative 1. And we have, uh, that is 1, so you end up with 1 half minus 1, and that comes out to be negative 0.5, or negative 1 half. So that is the order pair 1, negative 1 half. And then the last one, if x is equal to 2, we plug x in for 2 right there. That would be 1 minus 1, I believe, which would work out to be 0. And that would be the order pair 2, 0. Right there's your x values and your y values here. So now it says to, uh, let's plot this graph and uh, take a look at what happens when we do that. So if we plot this first point, negative 1 would be, here's the origin, negative 1. Down, uh, there's negative half would be right there. And I may, oh, I bet you were trying to find that mistake, weren't you? That up there, that's negative 1.5. I bet you all were excited. Doesn't count. I got it. Negative 1, negative 1 and a half is right there. All right. At 0, negative 1 would be right there. At 1, negative 1 half would be right there. 
at 2, 0, it would be right there. So there you see the points. It asks us to go ahead and connect those points with a line. So take a straight edge and graph that line like such, hopefully better than mine, and you have a graph of the uh, the function y equals 1 half x minus 1. When you graph in a real life function rule, choose appropriate intervals for the units on the axis, which we'll do in the next problem here. As this one, we're just learning how to do it. We typically use just uh, uh, the, the fr uh, ones if we can, uh, intervals of ones if that's appropriate. So I'm going to hit pause on this one and pick it up here in a moment for video two.